Welcome to season two of Nonfiction. This is the show where we get into the nitty gritty, all of those nuances that shape our Asian identities. And it is the perfect space for our first episode of season two. We are at Sash Restaurant speaking with the one and only Sash Simpson. His story, if you don't know it, is going from a street kid in India, literally at the age of five, to being adopted here in Canada and now being the celebrated celebrity chef that he is today. It is going to be a good one. The whole season is fire. So here we are, nonfiction, spicing up life one meal at a time. We are kicking off season two of nonfiction with you at Sash, with Sash at Sash. I am so excited because this is the perfect, perfect way to start season two. Episode one. With episode one, with the restauranter, with the chef, and uh, we're going to talk about everything. We're going to get into the documentary Born Born Hungry. We're going to get into the documentary Born Hungry, directed by Barry Averidge, produced with Priyanka Chopra Jonas. But I have so much more I want to talk to you beyond that so got it we gotta dig into the food and dig into got some juicy it. conversation i'm here okay i'm glad to meet you yes and uh, heard you. about you but had to have you actually in my restaurant yes and i'm honored it's to be nice here. to be listen honors mine please oh, i love it okay so i want to start at the beginning for listeners who might not know your story when i I'm a, letting you know up front, I'm a openly emotional person. And so there were so many touch points in watching your documentary um, that hit me. And hopefully I will make it through this. <laughs> but <laughs> Me too. I mean, I, I get emotional as well. But uh... yeah. So starting from the beginning, um, there was fragments, fragments of your childhood. So can you take us through that childhood and the pieces that you remember from five years old, correct? Correct. Well, listen, uh, the, um, the movie really opened up who I was. And I think before the movie, I bottled a lot of the stuff inside of me. Uh, it's because I didn't want to talk about it, um, mainly because I think I had um, a rough beginning being on the streets of India uh, and being a runaway and the whole bit. Um, but I think once me being on the street and being picked up and put into this orphanage at that age, and, uh, you know, no kid should go through that. I mean, a lot of the kids in India, it's very common that mm -hmm. they do go through this, and I was prime example of one of them. And, uh, and, and doing this movie and and getting to know myself uh, as far as Sash and how how I came about. Mm -hmm. And um, I think being a little kid in India and and growing up to what it is now, it's it's a you know different take on how I see things, but still keep what I remember. Mm -hmm. you know? And then Sandra Simpson comes into your life. My mom, my, you know, everything, you know, uh, my my adopted parents are the key to me, and uh, again, this movie would never exist. Not even the movie, like Sash, doesn't exist. Um, I think Sash could have been dead on the streets of India, because I know for a fact when they picked me up, I was sick as a dog. I was skinny as a pencil, uh, weighed probably sixty pounds, if not even less, and uh, like I was thin. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I got picked up by people that work for my mom and gave me this opportunity and uh, you know being in the orphanage is one thing but being adopted to the person that owns the orphanage is another thing and 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 I had that opportunity and I got mm -hmm. lucky in every way possible uh, getting to this family Sandra and Lloyd Simpson so they were a big part of me and uh, I thank them every day. Unfortunately, both of uh, both of them are not with us anymore. So, uh, you know, it's even extra special for me to, to like, I, I guess, you know, again, I'm finding myself as I go through. Mm -hmm. And in the documentary, I saw little pieces of, I can't even imagine. I mean, 
Sandra and Lloyd Simpson, amazing people. The amount of siblings that you had. And my first question was, how does the bathroom <laughs> situation work? <laughs> my two kids spend enough time in the bathroom. How does that possibly work? Listen, I, I thought about that too when, when I was in that damn house. <laughs> Listen, 32 uh, siblings. 32 siblings. But four of them were biological to my mom yeah. and my dad. And the rest, 28. I was one of the 28 that were adopted. Uh, now, most people would go, this is insane. How the hell did your mom, your dad adopt 28 kids? They had four already. Well, those 28 kids, they weren't all adopted. Uh, I was adopted, runaway. But some of those, most of those kids were, uh, you know, I think they were in families already mm -hmm. in Canada and America and stuff. But what really hurts, I'm going to say this, is that a family adopts a boy or a girl, then they find out it's not what they wanted. So they would call my mom going, Sandra, blah, blah, blah. It's not what I thought. Uh, I'm not, you know. So my mom would go, okay, no problem. So she would take the kid back. And what is she going to do? Put, her, put him or her back into the orphanage? No. So what she does is, of course, my mom would do this. She goes, you know what? You're not going anywhere. You're coming into my family. You're a Simpson now. And that's how most of the kids came about in my family mm -hmm. is, you know, people didn't want them. And you know what I think is so beautiful about your mother? And so many of us here will say, you know what? I can't have kids. It's so expensive to have a child. I can't have another child. And then I see your mom and yeah. what she did and what she's done. And She's a saint, man. She's a Mother Teresa. Uh, she has all the accolades that you can friggin' get or have in Canada. She has the Order of Canada, like everything. But you wouldn't know it because she doesn't talk about it. And that's not her thing. Uh, money's not her thing. Money is about, you know, she has it, which she did. She took kids off the streets, mm -hmm. wherever that is. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh, India, Somalia, El Salvador. We had four orphanages around the world. Now we only have two, mm -hmm. Bangladesh and India. Mm -hmm. But that, that was her goal, you know, mm -hmm. giving kids home. And she felt third world countries, you know, back in those days, uh, you know, 40 years ago, Third world, India was a third world country. Mm -hmm. But fast forward now, India is very dominant mm -hmm. in the world, and, mm -hmm. and uh, rightfully so with the amount of people that they have. And they've come up, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like it's good to see that. It makes me feel good that at one point in my life that um, I didn't like India. Uh, There's so many reasons for that, as, as like being on the streets and stuff, and, and, um, but now when you think about it, wow, I'm very proud to be from India because mm -hmm. I'm getting older and I'm getting very emotional about the whole where you're from. Mm -hmm. And Canada is my home, but man, there's a big heart to India, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, uh, my mom did the right thing till she touched a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think anybody that knows my mom, they will tell you, wow, you would never meet anybody like a Sandra Simpson. Mm -hmm. so. I believe it. Yeah. And you touched a little bit about identity, and I wanted to talk about those themes of identity and belonging and how you felt growing up, knowing, reconciling these two very, very different lives. Well, listen, uh, the good thing is I got adopted at a young stage. And... Uh, Am I finding out now who I am? 100%. Back in those days when I was like 5, 8, 10, 12, I was just happy to have a family. Uh, I was happy to go to school, happy to have friends, and happy to have siblings, living in a nice house. And, and you know, as I get older, I'm working and I'm having fun. So opportunities were given to me. Uh, they were there, and I just went to got it. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing was handed to me and say, hey, here's a million dollars. Go do whatever you want with it. That wasn't mm -hmm. the case at all. They, in fact, it was totally the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, I think I remember being 
16 and uh, I needed glasses. And um, I didn't want to wear glasses. I hate friggin' glasses when I was young. And, and it just made me look different. I didn't want to look different. And, um, and I remember my mom buying me glasses. And then I told my mom, from now on, you're not buying me anything. I don't want any clothes, this and that. I have three newspaper routes. I'm making my own money. I have a job at a restaurant, being a busboy, dishwasher. I'm good. And, uh, and that was the last of it that she's ever bought me anything because I wouldn't take anything from her. And I remember telling her, if you have anything to give it to the kids when it's time, I don't want, I don't want to be one of those kids. I don't want anything. Mm -hmm. You've given me, you have no idea. So, yeah. What was your relationship like with your siblings? And I'm sure because there was yeah. varying age gaps as 100%. well. Yeah, I mean, listen, we, we as, for, as you can see, all this food, it's very global. You know, mm -hmm. I got Indian, I got Japanese. We haven't uh, even eaten. We are I just... Know. <laughs> and, and you got my Indian take on lamb and I got my mm -hmm. French. So the whole, my menu is very global influenced. Mm -hmm. It's because my family's global influenced. Mm -hmm. I have Korean sisters, uh, you know, Cambodian brothers, Chinese, Vietnamese, Spanish, Indian, Bengali. So we had this Benetton of a family. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, so it, it, it was just fitting. My menu was better of everything because when you look at a restaurant, who comes into a restaurant? Anybody. Mm -hmm. So if anybody, any color, doesn't matter, man, there's something for you on the menu. Yes. And that's the way I approach my menus all the time. And, and I've always said, have a great menu, uh, be you know, versatile on them, flexible on the menu itself, and at the same time, hit them with different flavors. Because mm -hmm. people have a palate, and it's not a bland pa palate. Yeah. They want to have excitement when they're eating. They're going, wow, this is really good. And I've always captured my food as in, you can have sash food, but you can never fucking have sash food anywhere else. And that's a, that's a coat that I've always taken it with me, and I get it from my clientele. They can be in Florida, mm -hmm. Miami, wherever, Bahamas, and they'll always text me, email me, sash, you need to put a restaurant here. Because we need your food. Because why? Because you can't get my food anywhere. Yes. And I mean, you have worked, like you said, from the bottom all mm -hmm. the way to yep. where we are now. You're known as a celebrated celebrity chef. Um, North 44 is where you sort of got that. I grew up what? as in, uh, North 44 was a... a, a a fine dining start for me. Yes. Prior to that, I was working for restaurants like, you know, fast food joints. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, got introduced. This is a kitchen. This is a restaurant. Here you go. Well, mm -hmm. well have fun. But North 44 was a um, totally opposite hemisphere of yes. what I was used to. Uh, and it was good for me. And uh, kept me at bay, kept me out of trouble. But at the same time, I felt... This was something I needed to pursue, and because uh, I was, people always told me, "Oh, you have a knack for cooking. You're you're really good at managing, and you you do you can do this, do that." When I came to North Forty Four, it was like, "Oh my God, these guys! What? You went to cooking school? You learn how to cook?" Was it a very bear? <laughs> I never. I'm upset. Have you watched Bear? You know what? I, I haven't. I, I hate to tell it you, is anxiety. I haven't. I hear about it all the time. <laughs> I need to have time to watch it. You have to watch it, yeah. and I love to know if any of that. I was imagining your experience at North Forty Four, replicating somewhat of Bear. Listen, people look at my life; they go, "Oh, I, it reminds me of Slumdog Millionaire, Lion." And the funny thing is, I haven't watched any of those movies. <laughs> and when I hear stories of what is it about, they go, "I said, well, I live it. Yeah. Why would I watch it? This is this. If you've seen that, that's what I am, kind yeah. of deal. And the same thing goes to cooking and being at North Forty Four, is that cooking was very simple for me. It wasn't ever tough. I can take the people go, man, kitchen is so hard. It's like mm, I don't know, not for me. I find yeah. it very my sanctuary. Uh, uh, I go into a kitchen. I'm in a zone. Um, Go, they'll go, where's Chef? Well, he's in his office. Well, I'm not really in my friggin' office. My <laughs> office is the dish room. Yeah. So I go in there doing dishes. So that's my kind of zen out. 
And uh, but cooking came very easy. But North Forty Four taught me elegance of food, mm-hmm. um, how to make food look pretty, but yet make it look make it taste so amazing. They go, wow, this is this is I eat food all the time, but I've never had this kind of food. Mm-hmm. It's just getting quality ingredients and and putting it on a plate and composing it, and and where you can look at it and go. I don't know if I want to eat it or take a picture. I don't know. What am I supposed to, you know? <laughs> so that's the kind of fine dining experience I got to. So we know what you're good at. What is something that you're not good at that you'd like to be better at? Golf. <laughs> <laughs> I think every guy would tell you that. Golf. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't do, I mean... Um, that's a tough question because I'm not really good at, you know, being sash as in, because I hold a lot of stuff behind. And uh, if there's one thing that I have a, I want a quality is to be more talk about things and uh, like feelings, this, that, because mm-hmm. I hide it a lot. And, um, and that's one thing that I would say that I can really work on and uh, you know when somebody feels down I'm like oh okay whereas other people would my wife would go oh my god you okay this is, I'm not one of those guys <laughs> and I and I'm like okay I need maybe I need to kind of work on this but I realize it's sash that's what because it all takes back to the streets of India I was hard knocks lived on the street um, I don't care and it, like if you know what I went through you know stop crying get back to it kind of deal, right? That's, mm-hmm. I'm just hard of stone most of the time. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> so, yeah. And I want to get into the documentary and more, I mean, it, it is your, that is your life. And I can't imagine, I myself, I, I am Indian background and I actually haven't been back to India for almost 20 years now Jeez, okay. because of lots quite, changed a lot yeah i know and yeah. i understand nowhere to your extent but even just i you were there to 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 find family and i'll tell you a quick little story when last time i was in india um one of my cousins just suddenly disappeared and we didn't we didn't know where he was yeah and I was just there visiting and the thought of when you see when you go to India you can't explain India unless well, I have a story I'll tell you later but India, go ahead right and it I I got so much anxiety so many panic attacks because where do we where do we find him where do we possibly find him and then you would start going to all of these voodoo people and preachers like he's yeah. in the north he's in the south yeah. he's in the east yeah. he's in the west yeah we know he's in one of those directions yeah. we know he's somewhere which but one where? yeah and he ended up turning up three weeks later we're in gujarat yeah yeah he somebody found him in delhi on a roof and he doesn't know how he got there wow. and it just how old was he uh must be he, a young chap. No, he was early 20s, in his okay, 20s. Okay. So he wasn't a child, but okay. he was still, you know, and I was in my 20s at the time. And I thought, what if I, I don't know what happens yeah. to me. Like if somebody yeah. drugs me or I don't know, how would anyone ever find you again? And that's one that of the just, worst feelings. Yeah, that feeling. And then I think about you, it's trying to find a needle in a haystack. In an Indian haystack. In an Indian haystack. Nonetheless, you know what? It's 100%. And I think, uh, you know, India is so huge. And that comes with so many people. Mm-hmm. You know, about, I think 1.2 bill, I think, mm-hmm. if not more. Um, you can easily get lost if you're not contained mm-hmm. with your group. Yeah. Great example filming Born Hungry in India. I remember we finished uh, shooting. In certain location, but we had to walk, I think, maybe a thousand yards to shoot the other one. And everybody was walking. We were all walking. And and I lost everyone, my camera crew, every friggin' one of them. And I just stood there, what the hell? What? 
And I looked in the distance and I saw my cameraman, Ken, long Chinese hair, flowing. I can see his walk. <laughs> I go, oh my God, there he is. And I wouldn't take my eyes off and I just jetted over there. If it was another, you know, 10 seconds, I would have no clue where they were. Mm -hmm. And going back to that story of your cousin getting lost, when we were going to India, knowing that we we're going to shoot, I wanted to take my family. And then I realized, and I talked out of it by my producers and stuff, I, I don't know if we want to do that. I said, you know what? I think I'm not going to do it. It's only because I just can't imagine my youngest uh, Sawyer being, at that time he was uh, three, what if he got lost mm -hmm. in India? He's this high, this tall. There's, I'm, I, I couldn't live with myself mm -hmm. because I know what happened to me. Mm -hmm. So getting lost in India is, it can happen in a split second, you wouldn't even know it. And having taken my boy there, my boy there, if anything happened to Sawyer, I would die. I, because that's the whole thing. Now, I make a joke of it when we go. I said, we're going to handcuff my boys to me. Mm -hmm. There's no way there's no, they're going to separate, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be hard when I take my family back. And, uh, you know, you can't get lost in India. It's very, very easy to do that. Mm -hmm. so. 100%. And so when you're in India, these memories start coming back to you. There is, I don't want to give anything away, but, you know, there's, the movie theater, even just seeing the gates. I remember, and I, I know this as a child, you saw the yeah. gates, you thought they were sky high, and then now you, now you can see over the gates. Yeah. Of Well, listen, again, filming, I, there's mixed feelings when I left Canada to go to India, uh, and uh, but what it really hit me hard was the plane ride, because now you're in the air. Now you're flying to India. Now I'm like, oh my God, this is happening. And everything, like, I'm going to go to all these places. And where I got picked up, where this, that, I'm just going to be searching, you know. And this, I never thought in my wildest dream I would be making a, a movie, uh, you know. And the fact that I was, and going to do this, you're going to start opening up cans of worms that you don't want to see or you might mm -hmm. want to see. And... Uh, you're going to open up a Pandora's box, man. And, and, and I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to get? I'm like, what am I going to see? Am I going to find them? And, and nothing was scripted. Mm -hmm. And um, the only thing that was scripted was we knew we were going to A, B, C, D, E. And, and that's what it was. And hopefully in one of those places, we're going to find a connection to my family or a connection to where I could have been. I could have been born, found. I don't know. And that was the whole journey of it. And, uh, you know... Uh, again, I don't want to give out the movie for people that haven't watched it, is that I found myself. Mm -hmm. And that was the most beautiful part of it because I don't think ever, if I didn't do this movie, a lot of things wouldn't have happened. It would have been the same old sash of, yeah, he was from, I'm from India, and, that, and that's it. I got adopted, and that's all it was. But I think it opened up a lot of things for me as far as, flavors of the food mm -hmm. Indian spices are endless mm -hmm. and and the fact that I have access to it and it's my country it's my homeland mm -hmm. it's a I was a little kid in a candy store I was eating off uh, street vendors all my 10 to 12 days that I was there mm -hmm. and rarely did I eat at a restaurant and uh, it was a different experience mm -hmm. so it was you know the movie is a movie uh, I think everybody should uh, see it because, not because it's my movie. I think it's a movie of, of lifting people up. Uh, it's an inspiration movie. It's a feel-good story. And it's the authentic story of a kid mm -hmm. that grew up in India. Mm -hmm. What, for you, was the most challenging or that point in filming the movie in India that really s has stayed with you? I think the orphanage. I think the orphanage uh, reminiscing uh, flashbacks of me being knee-high running around in that compound and uh, hanging out the kids and the fact that I went back and seeing beautiful kids at the orphanage and they have so much potentials 
and they won't get adopted. And that mm -hmm. was a killer to me. And, um, you know, like I said in the movie, I mean, I was one of the lucky ones and mm -hmm. uh, everybody should be out. But I think that's going to stay, stay with me forever. It's never going to mm -hmm. leave because those kids are so damn bright. Um, nobody would know it. And the fact that they're so content, that's even makes it worse. Yeah. Such a good way. And that's, yeah, I told you, yeah, that's that scene in the orphanage and seeing those children mm -hmm. sitting on the floor, yeah, seeing the young girl you spoke to, yeah. and you know she has these aspirations, she wants to be a journalist, yeah, and yeah. I think of I think of oh, yeah. of all the children. I my father comes from an extremely extremely poor family. Yeah. If you you know his house was a, literally a cow dung yeah. hut and. I see Listen, the poverty it's, it's, and it, see the I see the I'm potential. seeing the emotions in you and I see the emotion in me and good people when they see this movie they're going to tear down. It's a tearjerker of a movie and because it's authentic mm -hmm. and uh, it's real. Nothing's friggin' scripted in this shit. This is how it is in India. This is how it was in India, and it still is. It still is. And um, uh, the only way it changes is has to be people like me, people like you, uh, gives a damn and mm -hmm. um, does something. And it's perspective. My husband was watching it with me, and he looked over, and he said, Mira, I know you're going to go back there, and you're going to adopt a child. And I yeah. said, you know what? Maybe I am. Yeah. Um, and people I, always I said, would I ever adopt? And I'm like, 100%, yeah. <laughs> no question. Every time I go there, I want to fucking bring somebody here with me in a yeah. suitcase. Uh, but that, that's what this movie does mm -hmm. because it's, it's, the re it's, it's reality. It ain't fantasy. You're not watching something on a silver screen going, oh, that's a movie. Okay. No, man, this is the real stuff that people don't get to see. Mm. And uh, it's not action-packed with guns and this and that. Mm -hmm. It's with uh, with feelings and, mm -hmm. and this real-life kids that are out there that need a home. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where my mom, my mom comes in. Yes. Gives them the orphanages, the home. Mm -hmm. And um, so this movie will hopefully, well, now that I have this fl platform and in my 50s, what I want to do is to keep that orphanage forever mm -hmm. and take the legacy of my mom, what she's built, yes, to the next level. Yeah, and um, it lives on sponsorship, and hopefully, I can do more than talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, action speaks louder than words, and I think that's where I need to be in doing charity events in this restaurant mm -hmm. and getting people in here donating get their checkbooks out and write something on it a yeah. number and then it goes into the orphanage because i think uh, a lot of things the orphanage needs and uh, there's a lot of part that i didn't want we didn't want the movie to be seen on it because it's not a good site mm -hmm. and uh i didn't want it to be too harsh mm -hmm. but as far as the directors and the producers um they put the storyline in a good way. And um, mm -hmm. the ending's amazing. As far as the starting was amazing, how it came out and then how it ended, uh, they did um, a phenomenal job on it. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of the movie and uh, there's a lot to offer in that movie. So I think when people see it, they do a reality check on themselves. Mm -hmm. And because we do take a lot of things for granted or what we hear what we have here and uh, this and that. You know, we get mad at a bar barista when we go mm -hmm. to a coffee shop <laughs> when she doesn't get it right. It's like, <laughs> if, Yeah, that's you know, my own perspective and it makes you see yeah. the, the grand scheme of things. A hundred percent. For people who, I have actually a few friends who are adopted and, <clears throat> you know, people that may be watching this, listening to this, who are adopted and feeling some of those same feelings um, of, you know, who am I? There's missing pieces. Yep. yep. What advice would you have for them who maybe are struggling through those emotions or like you suppressing 
these feelings or memories? Yeah, you know what? I wouldn't have had an answer for you if you asked me this probably a couple of years ago or beyond that. But I can somewhat have an answer now only because I've been... Um, the kids that's been in the orphanages in when I was in the orphanage. So some of those kids have been adopted around the world. And, and the funny thing is these girls that I used to hang out with in the orphanage, they've been adopted in Canada. Oh, wow. So one girl, Molly, uh, she start contacting me. And because she knows my family, because Sandra Simpson, because she lives in Hamilton, mm -hmm. and this and that. And so she created this group from the orphanage. So there's about, you know, I think 10 of us. Wow. And uh, so they all been in this restaurant. So every time she comes, she's been here probably a handful of times. And they all come in, and she brings a new person every time. And now there's a connection. So my answer to you question is that try to find a link when you got adopted if there's anybody that you know and somebody found me mm -hmm. and now we're creating this group where you know I know a couple of people that came to the restaurant with the group they don't know who I was I don't remember him mm -hmm. then I looked at her I go well I remember you so there's a lot of people that you can look at and you were hanging out, and it's funny, I'm like, fuck, I can remember so many things when I was at that stage of age, how do I not remember this girl? Mm -hmm. And it, and she's like, and I don't remember you. And it's like, it was just like back and forth, I'm like, oh my God. So we had to talk about it, mm -hmm. and memory was trickling Triggered, back. Triggered, yeah. Oh my God, I re okay, I, now I remember. So it's good that they need to have that connection, because if you don't have any link, to you being a doctor or anybody around you, mm -hmm. it's going to be tough. Difficult, Whereas yeah. in my case, I have people, and I have people calling from Baltimore, Washington, and, hey, I was in, your, in the orphanage with you. Here's a picture of me. And I look at the picture. I go, oh, my God, I remember you. So that can be goose That's and incredible. And it's just, and they're all like, you know, I have five kids, and I have six grandkids, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and uh, you hear these stories, and when I'm in Toronto, I'm coming to see you, and people come and see me because of the, you know, they see me on TV, and they mm -hmm. hear stories, but I think it's a good connection with adopted kids being in the orphanage. I get so happy now that I get to connect with the kids that I hung out with for that, you know, year and a half, two years that I was in the orphanage. We still have pictures, and, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh my God, now it's 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 fascinating to see that we got out of that orphanage and got into a family here and we can connect still mm -hmm. you know we i had this call last night uh, somebody facetimed me and i rarely pick up a facetime if i don't know who you are mm -hmm. but somebody said it's a phone call so i just went like this and i before i did i went what the hell <laughs> and it was facetime and it was a girl named tanga money who was in my orphanage and she came for dinner with that group that I was talking about uh, not even a week ago. And she goes, oh, my God, I've been FaceTiming you, and you finally picked up. And I said, Tanga money? And I go, in my head, I'm going, but she's blind. How is she FaceTiming me? And I go, can you s see anything? She goes, no, I'm totally blind. I go, then why are you FaceTiming me? Can you, you can't. She goes, no, but I can hear you. Um, and I went, okay. And it's like, oh, it's like listening to a podcast and imagining putting mm -hmm. a vision to that conversation. And she goes, brother, I love you. And when I met you, and I, and I, I go, oh, my God, I, and the voice and this, I'm so happy. For, and, like, I want to stay, she wanted to stay connected. Mm -hmm. And she's like, how can we uh, um, excel your mom's work her legacy I said well we can talk about it there's you know I might want to do a book people want to do a book about me we'll incorporate my mom into it and what she's at. but the fact that she's blind wow. and she's fucking FaceTiming me and wants to talk to me and like I'm looking at her and but I don't have to look at her because I can hear her voice but I'm still looking at mm -hmm. her I'm fascinated by her mm -hmm. looking through the phone just staring and talking it blew me away last night I was like, 
oh my god wow this is how much she wants to reach out because she doesn't know how i look like mm -hmm. you know and everybody she came with she doesn't know how they look like yeah but she takes that voice that you have and what she's done and, and she reads the articles and hears watches and she said i want to watch the 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 movie and i'm telling her money i wish you can fucking see it you know but the fact that you want to hear the whole mm -hmm. she goes i can i just want to hear it because yeah. i can because she puts a she paints her own yes her own picture. picture of listening to or watching my or hearing my movie or listening to a podcast you know so that it just it showed me that people you don't you know if a blind person can have an ability to go above and beyond to do whatever and sees it the way she sees it mm -hmm. and it show it's so beautiful because you have <laughs> you have your family with the Simpsons and then you also have this extended family my adopted uh, yeah my orphanage you know, from family your orphanage family and you know we always think oh, what are these grand big things we could do to change the world yeah changing one life yep yeah. like That's I actually I think I'm gonna go to Ottawa because this is where uh, Tangamani uh, lives and uh, you know I might go with some of my uh, kids from the orphanage we're all gonna go to uh, Ottawa and then take her out and go for dinners and have a have a chat uh, basically reminisce about mm -hmm. when we were friggin five six seven <laughs> so you know whatever we can remember and we talk about you know there's something they can talk about they do talk about I have no clue what they're talking about yeah but they have their they have their you know reminiscing days and then I'll talk about something they'll have no clue so we always incorporate our stories, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what And I mean, th hopefully through this documentary, more people will even connect and, you know, somebody maybe in India will, will see that. The whole movie was to go international yes. and hopefully, you know, to find everything that I'm looking for. Again, I'm not going to give out the movie, mm -hmm. but it's something that it will trigger worldwide and go from there mm -hmm. but yeah it's a beautiful thing i want to end on a a lighter note i also want to eat with you um it's a documentary but say it was a feature film who who do you think could best play you oh my god <laughs> the man who doesn't watch movies or television <laughs> i don't i um i don't know i mean there's such a amazing actor I mean, he's already played it, I think, right? I think he did The Lion. Mm -hmm. And uh, Patel, what's his name? Dave Patel. Patel. Yep. So, I mean, I and don't know. And he did I, Slumdog. I, I, never, I never looked at it that way. And, uh, I mean, I think if it gets into Netflix, you know, I know Netflix has a habit of getting documentaries and stuff and making a movie out of it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and Priyanka's involved in producing it, so hopefully, she had some she has some bite in it to mm -hmm. get it into Netflix. And uh, I mean, I think from now till whenever, I think every year it's gonna go somewhere, and that's mm -hmm. what it's supposed to be doing. It's yes. a, it's a document. It's gonna go to all kinds of festival film festivals circuits, all yeah. over the world, and then go international, see where it goes. But as far as who plays me, I have no damn clue. And whoever does it. <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, I trust it, but we'll see. We'll yeah. see. We'll you see. Know. That's an, that's the next chapter. I'm not even thinking about it. I, <laughs> I just, it came to me this morning. It's like, hmm, yeah, I wonder who would play just, you. I don't know if anybody can play this kind of movie. This is too much, too much uh, emotionally drained, you know, what they're going through. And I don't feel it's a, you can make a movie out of the, it's, it's just too much of, it's too powerful of what the real world is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people are ready for accepting what's out there. And uh, I think a lot of people live in their fantasy lands. And uh, mm -hmm. But that's why it's so important and, to, and, and, and I to always look say at that. it. Look Listen, at it dead on. This, yeah. is, this is the reality. Yeah, and people have their visions, right? I think social media sees it and stuff, but I don't think people can really grip reality. And mm -hmm. I don't know 
because they don't want to or they can't. I don't know. I, I, I think reality is too harsh. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd rather stay in a fantasy land, uh, what I can be, what I want to be. and uh, Yeah, sure, stay, stay in your land. <laughs> but yeah. the real world, this is what it is. It is. You know. And I often think about this in the real world, um, you know, just through my father's story and other people's story. It's not always, oftentimes, it is not often the most talented people who make it big, you see the amount of the immense talent and brains across the world. And uh, I just think I've lost my train of thought. I'm just thinking about all of these different. Yeah, but listen, I'm not I'm not brilliant. I'm not fucking book smart. <laughs> I'm like not even close. But I'll tell you, I am street smart. I am common <laughs> sense. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. And that's all I need to know. Yeah. And that's the way. Uh, I've been brought up, I've been taught, and, uh, you know, was I good in school? 100% not. <laughs> I had the worst grades, and and I knew that. And, and So you had some uh, great hairstyles. 100%. I will say. 100%. <laughs> all kinds. All kinds of hairstyle. And that's funny, one of my clients told me that last night. Dude, I've known you, and I didn't know that story to that extent, but the hair. I just said, how many hairstyles does he have? But yeah, it, I, hair was a big deal for me. If we're just getting off this topic, what, hair was a big deal. What was the deal. music that was influencing Michael Jackson. that hair? <laughs> yeah. I'm a Michael yeah. Jackson diehard fan yes. to this day. And Prince, the whole Prince. bit. I mean, I see Prince, I see and, Prince and, and, in and there. I, and for me, it's always been that kind of music. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think the hair was, I mean, my parents meant a lot to me back in those days how I looked how I mm -hmm. walked how I dressed and it was my style and uh, to anybody else would be like what the fuck is that and for me it's mine yeah. it's not yours that's what makes me different than you and, and whatever I want to do I did yeah. and uh, nobody can tell me different right that and you brought me back to that question I lost my train of thought on and it's mine it's not yours I don't know well you don't watch TV I don't know <laughs> if you know this or not or it's on social media the recent with Simu Liu and the bubble, bubble tea. Bubble no, tea. No, no. Bubble I tea. Okay. Uh, I heard about it, but I don't. So, you can fill me so, in. So, uh, do you know the show Dragon's Den? Yes. So, uh, a couple had come on Dragon's Den. They were from Quebec and they were saying, you know, looking for, it was a massive, massive investment that they were looking for. And they essentially wanted to make Boba tea and they're saying they wanted to elevate it and make it better. And Simu Liu is one of the guest um, dragons. Okay. And right away he said, this, something, this doesn't feel right because there is no, this is a very authentic Taiwanese drink and right. there's no mention, there's no mention of Anywhere that. Anywhere on the bottle. At all. Correct. And by you saying, you know, people don't really know what it is and we're just going to make it better. And there was, it it blew up this whole that whole scene with him blew up it to to very extensive yeah. levels it did yeah. and it brought up to me and a lot a lot of people are talking about this cultural appropriation and so many different things i think about it in yoga um i heard about some drake yoga and i'm like that doesn't feel yeah that just doesn't feel right more to of a me. money money catcher right? kind of deal yeah um when there's no connection to the authenticity. Yeah. And yeah. I wanted to ask you, as a chef, where does it come in? Like, because there's so much beautiful fusion in cuisine. Yeah. But then, do you ever feel like there's a cultural appropriation of cuisine? Or what do you even think about the that boba tea example? Well, listen, for me, as far as connection with the foods and stuff, I just say, be real and be authentic in your head. And what do you think it is, mm -hmm. right? I know what Indian food is, because I'm Indian. I know what it is. But would I want to bring an Indian restaurant? Into, that's, I don't want to do Indian restaurant, because I've been trained in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, our country is so diverse. And I always feel, you know, back in those days, like, oh, I, you know, I never ate Indian food at home. I grew up with 32 siblings. Mm -hmm. We never ate Indian food. There was no fucking Indian food. It was spaghetti, <laughs> sloppy joes, grilled cheese, scrambled eggs, bacon. It was westernized food. 
So when I left home and stuff, I was getting, you know, featured to all these foods and flavors. I was like, oh, my God. And for me to create my menus, you know, I put my own twist into it. I'm not recreating Indian foods and, you know, tiki masala or mm -hmm. chana masala, or Madras curry. It's my version of Madras curry chicken. Yeah. You know, oh, this Madras curry chicken should be spicier. Yeah, not everybody fucking yeah. likes spice, right? <laughs> and and look where look read the room. You're you're yeah. in an elegant restaurant. What am I going to put like a bunch of chilies and make you sweat in your beautiful clothes? And it's not what it is. It's flavors, mm -hmm. right? Find your flavors, find your niche where people go. Wow, this is insane. I love Indian food, and this curry Madras curry chicken that you just gave me, Sash. I've had many curry chicken. This is insanely amazing. Yes. Well, because I don't give you two cups of oil floating on top. That's not <laughs> what I'm doing here. I would eat it, but this is a different cat, and this is what I do. And I create Indian food. I, I refine it mm -hmm. to my liking and my clients. I read my clients really well. I know what they like. Yeah. Do you know I make Indian dishes every fucking night in here? Why? Because it's a word of mouth. It's yeah. not on the menu, yeah. but I do off the menu. Hey, Sash, I heard my friend was here the other night. You, she was at a group, and, and you did like an Indian menu. I go, I did. She goes, oh, my, can, can I have that too? <laughs> so I don't say no. So if I'm not that crazy busy in the kitchen, we'll, we'll do something for you. Good to know. Notice. But <laughs> it's just be, be yourself and, yeah. and uh, try to do things that, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. You know, mm -hmm. that's not what you're doing. You're, you're, you're putting your twist on it. Yeah. That's what makes you, you. Yes. And if you try to be the same as the guy across the street, well, your restaurant's not different. No. Right? So this is why when people come here, they go, we can only get this at Sash. I can't get it any other restaurant in the city because nobody will do it no. the way I do it. At Sash, made by Sash. Yes, you can get a Madras curry chicken in any Indian restaurants or any other restaurant, but there's a different curry chicken that you get here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I always say. We use the finest ingredients and we have that special thing that I put on our plates. It's called TLC, tender love and care. And I preach that thing to my cooks every fucking day. It's not, stop thinking as a paycheck coming in here, start having passion, start putting TLC into your food and everything you touch. Because once you do that, then you become a different chef. Then you become a chef that loves food mm -hmm. it becomes a chef that you care about what you're putting out on a plate to waiter taking it to a table and people consuming it mm -hmm. once people consume that dish that's when the table turn mm -hmm. they go oh my god how come i never heard about this restaurant how come i never come here as often why do i go to these other restaurants and be disappointed with bad food bad ingredient and i come here and you go wow a lot of people, I think in general, restaurants are, people work very hard at it. Either mm -hmm. a shitty restaurant, putting out shitty food, or, you know, but there's one common denominator is that you work hard at it. You, everybody works yep. fucking hard from the busboy to the dishwasher to the bartender to the chef. We put out a good fucking product. And that's what I want people to understand. Put a good product out and people will notice and they'll come. That's and it. the aromas, the chana, I'm like, let's end this because I'm My, ready to eat. I have two Indian guys that work for me, <laughs> and they made that. Oh, and, yeah? and they I'm so And excited. they take pride in making it. It takes them literally three hours to make it. Wow. Right? Can I make that in 10 minutes? 100%. But this is what it is. These guys can make Indian food with love. I love it. Right? So tell me, did I miss? What have we missed? Where, first of all, where can people learn more about you you know what because uh i'm located at young and summer hill in toronto uh, it's called sash restaurant and wine bar and uh, you know don't let the white linen fool you uh, <laughs> i don't want you to go oh, it's so fancy it's not so fancy it's very fun i call mm -hmm. it elegant but very casual so you can come anytime lunch dinner and uh you can catch my movie on crave yep catch it at the theaters and uh, website, Instagram, I'm all there. I love it. Yeah. Let's eat. Go ahead. Thank okay, you. Let's Thank do you. this. Okay. So this is my chana masala. It's okay. a little 
vegan dish. And I have a bit of French, which is my uh, Dover sole. Uh, grilled, we do a nice shiitake mushroom duck cell. Do a nice Minera sauce with parsley, lemon, bit of Worcestershire. And I have some uh, blood orange on nice. top with parsley. Look, I don't eat fish and I'm going to try this. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. I mean, because I wish we ate it when it was hot, but that's okay. yes. And then, of course, my lamb. I've done it. Um, uh, an Indian fusion on it. It's oh. gunpowder lamb chops. Okay. I've done it with a sambar, which is a lentil stew. Yeah. And I incorporated pumpkin. Oh, that's the sambar. I can yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. Pumpkin. I have like the Indian vegetable, the drumstick. I have curry leaves mustard seeds, coconut uh, oil. So it's very delicious. It goes with the masala rice. And then, of course, my Japanese sushi take, which is my tuna tataki. Yeah. You know, I, there's a lot going on in this plate, and it's just crazy good. This is one of the things I can take off the menu. It's good. Listen, I'm very proud with this, about this restaurant, what we do, and, um, you know, just a lot of good things are happening as far as in my life as you know, the movie, the restaurant, and, uh, you know, just, I'm not done. We just, we just want to keep going, do, keep doing different things. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I love it. And that is a wrap on our first episode of Season 2 Nonfiction. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I wish you could have tasted all of those amazing flavors with me. You did get to enjoy all of Sasha's stories. And if you enjoyed the episode, if you enjoy nonfiction overall, please hit subscribe, like, do all of the things. Stay connected. It is an amazing season coming up ahead. And you can find us on social media as well. We are on Instagram at nonfiction show. So until next time, keep it spicy one meal at a time. <laughs>